Good morning, folks. Um, and Amar, thank you very, very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you for uh, the chance to come and speak to you this morning. Um, the, the theme of going back to basics actually is really, really good one. Uh, when, we, when we sort of said we'd like to come and talk, um, this, this, I think this presentation fits really nicely with that. Um, uh, my name is Simon McCullough. I am the Chief Technology Officer at a business called Nominet. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are the folks that run the UK domain name system. We run the registry behind the 12.5 million uh, domains that end in .uk. And we run the critical infrastructure, which is now critical national infrastructure, um, behind making sure that all of those domains that end in .uk, such as Amazon and eBay and your email addresses and everything else, we make sure they resolve around the world 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we've been doing that for the last 22 years. Um, the theme today really is about actually how we kind of went back to basics and we took a look at trying to solve an old problem um, using, different, using a new way of thinking but old methods. And actually what we discovered was you can do something really very different if you think differently. So as I'm talking, and you know, particularly in the spirit of this event, I want to challenge you to think about your own businesses and actually are there problems inside your business, particularly around cybersecurity today, where actually if you thought differently and you challenged some preconceptions, actually you might do something amazing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our story as we go. So this is us. We are a business of about 200 people. We are based primarily in Oxford and in London, in Paddington, and we also have an office in the United States. Um, we've been around since 1996. We started as a very small academic business when nobody really thought the internet would be get up to much. Um, it was run by three or four academics in their spare time, um, and what would happen is if you wanted to buy a domain, then uh, you would write to them or send them a fax or something as modern as that. And eventually, through the post, would come back a certificate to say, congratulations, here's your domain. Um, and they were doing this in their spare time when they weren't running lectures and doing everything else. And actually, uh, they thought this was all jolly good fun. And uh, then, strange enough, it stopped being fun when over 1,000 people uh, a week started registering for domains. And actually, at that point, people, they realized that we need a business. So Nominate was set up. We were set up as a kind of essentially as a not-for-profit business. We're a membership organization. Uh, and we are still that very same business. We're a lot bigger now. Um, but we, we have a membership of about 4,000 members who are mostly professional trade uh, bodies such as registrars and hosting companies. Um, and we remain as a, as a business that uh, doesn't distribute profit. So we operate in the public benefit and all of our profit is used for good purposes and doing tech for good. Um, so we've, our business has grown and we, and as I said now, we've gone from having a few thousand domains to 12.5 million domains under .uk. We also run um, uh, over 40 other top level domains for other companies. So we run things like .bbc, .bentley, uh, .vodka, uh, .horse, you name it. So we have a, we have a fair few interesting uh, and we continue to acquire those and we run domain services as well and that adds a couple of million more domains on the, the back end of our systems. And we do that and customers are attracted to us because of our expertise in running DNS. We're one of the oldest registry businesses in the world. Uh, we were formed not that far from, uh, from verisign.com uh, and actually uh, we've been doing that. But we recognise as a business that actually that world is changing, our world is changing. People, I bet, I want to just out of interest, how many of you have typed a domain name in this morning? Can I just, a show of hands, everyone's actually gone into their browser and typed a domain? One, two, three. Yeah, okay, ignoring that one. The reality of it is, is you don't tend to type domains anymore. And, that, and the, you know, we click on icons, we speak to Alexa, we talk to our car, we talk to Siri, um, whatever else it is. The reality of it is, is domains are reducing in importance. And as a business, we said, you know, we, we've got to actually start to look at other ways of, uh, of managing what we do and how we continue to make a living. So not on, top of, on top of our role as running domains, we actually started to look at um, an innovation program and particularly cybersecurity services. So I'm just going to show you a little, um, I asked the team, this is our researchers, to pull some data together actually and we did this a few months back and it, it, we, we turned it into a video. So what we did is we, we took all the data that we were getting from the UK domain name system and we, we, we sort of created a, a video. And you, what you can see here is this is live traffic that comes in and out of .uk on a daily basis. Um, you know, not surprisingly, people come from all over the world to .uk domains. We're the fifth largest uh, domain in the world, um, and actually, you'd be surprised where our queries come from. And as you see, even at four o'clock in the morning, we are receiving somewhere in between 10 and 15,000 queries per second. 
um, which is quite a lot. Now, bear in mind, this is not all the queries on the internet that come to UK. This is just, think, ISPs and caches, re caches being refreshed and everything else. But it gets pretty busy. And at our busiest time, which is around about lunchtime, because everybody's, uh, everybody's busy uh, going on Facebook and wherever else it is, they're doing, actually, we see about 40,000 queries a second, which is a phenomenal amount of, of data. And what happens with those queries is uh, we capture every single one of those and we take a look at them and we make sure that we answer, firstly, we're answering them correctly, but secondly, um, what's going on inside those queries. So when we looked at this as a problem, we said, well, actually, seven or eight years ago, we've got an incredible amount of data. But the challenge is, what do we do with that data and what do we do? How do we do some good with the data that we've got, not just serve up these, these domain name queries? And one of the things we had to look at, we said, is actually, it's an incredible volume of data to handle. It's a kind of classic big data problem, and it happens at speed as well. So what kind of techniques can you use to do that? And so, actually, we were starting to form our research unit, and we said, let's ask some really difficult questions. You know, one of the things we'd been told was, this just wasn't possible. It was not possible when you've got that volume of data to analyze that in real time. It's not possible to capture and pull the information out of that and do something meaningful. So we decided we're going to go back to do some real back-to-basics thinking about how we might answer that question. The first question, the first thing we did is we would not accept no for an answer. So we just said anything where someone says can't be done, not possible, it's too big, it's too small, it's too fast, let's ignore that. And we went back to basics. And actually, when we looked at it, we went right back. And this was some work I did when I was a student. Um, and my interest was physics. And when I was uh, down at Exeter University, I did a lot of work on acoustics. Um, it was my passion, kind of medical acoustics. And what well, project I was given to work on was something called acoustic holography, which sounds very fancy. But actually, what acoustic holography is, is about taking photographs with sound, taking three-dimensional photographs with sound. Just like you see a visual hol hologram, actually, you can do the same with sound. Um, this has some real-world applications, actually. And this, this, uh, what you see on screen here is a gas rig in, uh, in the Gulf. And now, these, one of the challenges with the gas rig is, as you can probably tell from the photograph, there's an awful lot of pipes. Uh, and what happens when you pump high-pressure gas through those pipes is, hopefully, the thing doesn't explode. Um, but typically, before the thing explodes, what tends to happen is they start to rattle. And the problem with rattling pipes on a big rig like this is, where is the rattle coming from? Now, how many of you have had a rattle in your car? How many, how many have recently had a rattle in your car? And how did you find it? Did you work out where it was? Anyone, how did you find it? With my ear. Okay, and how long did it take you to work it out? Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So you do this thing, don't you? You go around your car and you put your ear in, no, it's not there. And you go, no, hang on a minute, no, it's not there. Is it the stereo? Is it because I've left a can of Coke in the, in the side pocket? Exactly the same thing happens on an oil rig. And so the technique that they use on an oil rig is actually they take an enormous array of microphones on a very large pole. Okay, imagine this guy. And they walk around the edge of the platform with this pole and they take, they take a snapshot of the sound and then they take a foot to the right and they take a snapshot of the sound and then they, they do that all the way around. It takes them a whole day and in the middle of this is a pipe rattling away. Yeah. Like a, yeah. a photograph with sound. They listen to the sound that the rig's making, okay? And then they bring all of that data back together and they feed it through a computer algorithm. And what happens is it then tries to pinpoint where the sound is. And then some poor engineer has to put on the greasy uh, overalls and crawl through the pipes and tighten up the bolt on the end of the pipe that's rattling. And this really happens. And we wanted to understand whether actually this could, this could be applied uh, to other, other problems. And so we ended up with a research project that looked to see if we could hear a bumblebee above the noise of traffic. And we wanted to see whether actually in a, tra in a busy traffic jam, could you listen using sound to and recreate the sound of a bumblebee flying around the traffic. And so we built a research project around it. And what we did was we headed to the research papers and we looked at all the various techniques that were involved in this, kind of, this, this area of science. And to be fair, there's some pretty complicated maths in there. Um, and, some, and at a time when my brain could still handle complicated maths, that's what we did. And we did that work. And then we ended up actually going into the lab. We built that array of microphones, if you can see them here on the left. Um, and this is the, one of the boxes. We fit all these sound signals in, and we pumped it into a computer. And when we first did it over there, you can just see it hiding in the background. We got this very messy sort of sound photograph that didn't really help us at all. But we refined and we refined the experiment. We, kept, we tried to control all the variables we could. And it took us three or four months. And then we hit gold. And what you can see down here on the, on the photograph here, there it is, a little tiny square. Bear in mind, this is, this is a, the graphics of 30 odd years ago, was our bumblebee. And that was us being able, we could identify the sound of this bumblebee above the noisy environment that we were doing. So we, hit, we kind of hit success. It was pretty messy, took a lot of manual processing. But we had the kind of first inklings of, actually, this is an interesting piece of research work. So great, so that was all very interesting. But what actually has that got anything to do with cybersecurity? So, but that, 
hold that thought in the back of your mind about that kind of thing when you're thinking about some of the work you might have done in your career and where you came where you had a bit of a breakthrough. Just think about hold that thought for a minute. So take us on a wind back to 2010. So this was uh, those of you who may recognise William Hague. He was the Foreign Secretary at the time. Um, and he had just invented this word called cyber. Now, for those of you who remember 2010, <laughs> cyber meant something very different then, uh, and he was told, please don't call it cyber, call it advanced security or anything else, don't call it cyber. But he was intent on calling it cyber. So he went on to do, he said, he said, we face this great cyber threat from uh, terrorists and everything else. And everybody was starting to get very excited about this new field of cyber security. And at the time, we said, actually, I think we've probably got a role to play in this. When we were looking at Nominet, this is what this is the tool we used to use in 2010. This is the tool we used to use to manage and look at DNS traffic and traffic data. And actually, as you can see from the tool, it's not very great. That tool, you can still download it. It's called DSG. Um, and most operators who run DNS still use this tool to, man to manage their DNS. And it gives you a vague idea of the amount of traffic you have and where it's coming from. But it's pretty basic. You certainly can't see anything in there. You can't do it. But remember that bumblebee problem. Remember that noise of the traffic. This is the noise of the traffic, OK? This is just network traffic, not cars. So we got the team together and we sat down and we said, let's challenge every single thing that says can't be done. And we wrote down on the whiteboard, and this is one of the early screenshots of the whiteboard that we had, was pick every idea where someone says you can't do that, you can't do it, and try and work out how you do it. And let's throw all the rules out the window, let's throw all the compute rules that everyone thinks, thinks they know, because you're all thinking like engineers and you're all looking at it because you're in the same communities and working the same way. So let's throw those out, and that's what we did. And it took us a while, and we bashed through the ideas, and we bashed through the ideas. And actually, as we did it, we realized, actually, we're going to have to borrow some ideas from elsewhere again. So we, we, took, we took a look back, and actually, we said, well, who else is doing it? And it turns out one of the biggest problems with when you're monitoring network traffic is just how you manage the volume of it. Because it's one thing accepting all those DNS queries, but it's another thing then trying to capture the same flow. If you think about that flow through your pipe, through your network pipes, actually, you just end up doubling or tripling the traffic going through it. So we started to look at compression, and we started to look at some of the players in the market at the time who were doing it. We looked at graphics compression, lossless audio, video video compression, we looked at what Apple were doing and Dolby were doing, and we looked at their public research papers. And actually, when we did all of that work, we said, actually, we think we, can, we, we might have something here. And it turns out that DNS traffic suits compression really, really well. And so we had to go up building our own algorithms to take our traffic and compress it. And it turned out it worked. Not only did it work, we applied for two patents, and we got those, two European patents, sorry, and we got those as well. So we took that early research work and we turned them into patents for basically storing and capturing network DNS traffic. Um, so that was a very early success. And then we started to take this, we've got the algorithms, let's build a system to, to monitor it. And we started to use some of those techniques I talked about on the oil rig, about how we try and spot traffic. And we started to get some early results. And what you can see on screen was 2011, 2012. This was, this, was this was actually live UK traffic, and we were starting to get, as you can see, similar graphs to the one that I showed you earlier on, except we were capturing and managing that traffic very differently. And what we could do very quickly in this was we could break it down, we could understand a bit what was going on. But this was still really basic stuff. And then we took those, those techniques I talked about, about how do we actually start to look for patterns, how do we start to look for what's going on, and we applied that on top of those technologies. And then some interesting stuff really started to happen. And what you can see on screen here is we said, actually, let's not, let's not think like engineers. Let's not think about graphs. Let's think about things. Let's think about looking, using our eyes and using our brains, using our hands. So we built a huge touch screen, which we had one of the first in the country. And we said, we're going to throw away the keyboard. We're going to throw away any other device for it. And all we're going to do is use touch and sight. And we started to color all of our traffic. And not surprisingly, we started to get patterns. And you can see there's a pattern here. You can see there's patterns here. And what we started to do is we said, oh, what's that? I've not seen that before. Not, because, of course, we had no visibility. And no one had visibility to this at the time. Um, and we started to look into these patterns. We saw some really, really interesting stuff. And I'll talk about that in a second. So we knew we were onto something when we started to do this. And some of those old techniques were starting to work. And because that research work we'd done all that I'd done 20, 20, 30 years ago suddenly became actually really relevant again. And actually applying it to network traffic started to produce some results. So and then actually the hard yards really started. We had this early set of successes as a business. Um, we got the board, the chief exec quite excited. Um, the techies certainly were jumping up and down because all of a sudden they could see into the traffic like they'd never been able to see before. Um, uh, not surprisingly, law enforcement and various other folk got quite excited too because we were able to see into traffic like never before. Um, and then there was the hard bit, and that was two whole years. And we spent two years basically going back to basics. Okay, let's build something that actually works. Let's take all of that research work and build something. 
And that's the hardest bit when you're innovating, I think, is you've got your chief executive, you've got everybody saying to you, where's the product, where's the product, how's it coming on, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening. It'll be there, it'll be there, you've just got to trust me. And that was really tough because actually you have working behind the scenes and particularly in a community where actually everybody would share data and share information. Actually, we went quiet, we went dark for two whole years while we did this work. And that was challenging because people would say, what are you up to? What on earth are you doing? You know, you're normally talking about your research work. Ah, oh, no, we're fine, just a quiet period. You know, but actually we had a whole team of 10, 12 people beavering away, coding this thing. And our biggest challenge for us, I think, was a political challenge. You know, our board, um, and here they are photographed, our board were, you know, they were kind of, they wanted to see results. Now, when you're doing R&D work, everyone wants results, because you've promised them the world, and you said, we've got this cool new technique, and we think it's world beating. Well, let's see it, let's see it. When is it, can we see it? Say, no, you can't see it. Actually, we've gone back to the coding. We're back on the workbench now coding, and that's really hard. So keeping these guys, when you are doing this kind of work, keeping your boards happy and keeping them excited is, is as much of a challenge. And how you drip feed them with... Um, information. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to be advised by the uh, former CTO of British Telecom and he said one of the tricks he did was when he was doing research work out in Martlesham, he said that at one point he said the board were getting really, really uh, anxious about the product they were building. So he got one of his guys in the lab to build a black box, paint it black, put a red LED on the front of it. And he put it on the board table and said, well, here's the product, it's coming on. And when the LED flashes, you know, it's finding a problem. And, and they said, oh, that's amazing, that's great. So he said, you know, so I think there's a little bit of actually, um, there's, a, there's a little bit of telling, it's keeping your audience engaged when you're doing R&D work, you know, because actually it's really hard to go in front of a board and say, Here's our, here's our new Fourier transform algorithm. And actually what's really interesting is the delta, you know, the delta coefficient of this actually has really changed. We've made a real breakthrough. They're like, oh, great. So it's, it's quite hard. So it's very much a challenge when you're working on this stuff. And then we hit gold. And this is, this is the first, yeah, sorry. Can I just interrupt you there? Yeah. It's a two-year R&D program. Yeah. What did you set out as the business objective at the start? How did you keep the porting against that over the two years? Because I'm sure your CFO was asking, where's this money going? He was, absolutely. So we set out, we said to the business, you know, that we said two things. One is we need to, we need to do genuine, world-beating R&D work with, and, and not just kind of fluffy stuff, but real, genuine, hard maths, hard physics, hard engineering to, to really change, the, to change our, uh, our outcome as a business. And we set out to say we are going to use our traffic that we have to find something remarkable. I said, I don't know what we're going to find, but we will find something remarkable. And that's what we, and that's what we set out to do. And it was a simple, they were our two simple objectives, no more so than that. And as I say, political challenge, right, because to your point is, I didn't say actually what we're going to do is we're going to increase, we're going to increase our, our EBITDA by 3% as a result of this. You know, that's a nice hard board metric everyone can get excited by, actually. What we're saying is, I can't tell you what I'm going to find, I just know we're going to find something cool. So that was part of that challenge. What we found was, uh, after two years, actually was this, and this was our biggest breakthrough uh, at that point, which was finding, this is CryptoLocker. So is everybody familiar with CryptoLocker? And actually what we found was, well, you remember I said I asked the tool to ask for patterns, and we started it looking at patterns, and actually the first thing it said was seeing some really interesting traffic popping up, and what it found popping up was going on here, and these are nonsense domains, you can see at the top there there's a domain, actually these incredible spikes, and if you, if you spot a traditional domain, if you launch one tomorrow, um, what would happen with that domain was you would see a nice gentle ramp of traffic going up to it as perhaps you started to blog about it and Google search for it and everything else. But what happens here with CryptoLocker is it registers a domain, uh, registers it randomly with, with a set of characters here based on an algorithm, and that then the, the command and control host gets put on that domain, and then all of the various botnets, around, all the computers on the botnet around the world then talk back to it in a, a, a predefined interval. And straight away we spotted it. Um, what then happened is actually we spotted it cropping up and cropping up and cropping up and cropping up, and it turns out CryptoLocker follows a nice neat pattern in terms of the way in which it registers domains. Um, once we knew that, we could break it down and actually from that point so we could stop it from registering itself. So we could stop the command and control host from hopping around uh, the UK domain and that's exactly what we did. We worked with law enforcement, we worked with Wired and we got CryptoLocker shut down. And that was a huge, huge breakthrough for us. Um, uh, the board got very excited about this. They said, wow, this is remarkable. We made a whole bunch of PR off it and we made a lot of very good friends in law enforcement as we did that work. And we realised we were onto something and as I said, my point was we didn't know what we'd find. Um, but when you let a system start to look for stuff, actually, you, you find things that you're not looking for. So we knew we had something really good there. Um, what we discovered was also people suddenly wanted to buy our capability from us, and we had lots of inbound requests. We weren't actually in, the, in, the, in, the, in a selling uh, mode at the point, but we had a few people, and one of our very early customers was, was a small business called Comcast in the US, 
Um, and they said, we want your capability on our network. And sure enough, we said, OK, are you happy to be? It's in really early stages. And it turned out that actually when you try and drink from Comcast's DNS firehose, it's kind of, ch it's tr it's kind of challenging. They have 20 billion queries a day, um, which is a lot. Um, so we rewrote the in underlying engine again a second time. Um, and that was a challenge, because we had to kind of abandon the work we'd already done and say, we've got to, we've got to make this thing even faster. And we did. It took us three and a half months. Uh, and then at that point, we were live on their network, and we could pull 20 million queries a day, which is, which is a fairly remarkable uh, statistic, and analyze them in real time for them. And then something really interesting happened to us. Uh, we decided that we would, do, again, think really differently. And then what we decided to do was we decided to ask our capability to look at internet traffic very differently and look for stuff that shouldn't exist, a bit like SETI. So just, we, don't want to, we, we, know, we know the kind of queries that we're asked. We know email queries. We understand all that stuff. And so we were actually, let's, let's take a look at something that doesn't exist. And we set the system up to look for things that basically shouldn't find. And for a long while, it found nothing, blank, empty space. <laughs> Until this day, and this guy popped up. One DNS query popped up. And we said, that's odd. And we took a look at the query, and it was completely malformed. It didn't look right. Uh, it's, we, we couldn't understand how it was possible for that to appear. Uh, none of the uh, resolver software on the, in the internet, none of the name servers, should generate a, a packet that looks like that. So we dug into that packet. And actually, when we, when we started to research it, we, would we were firing the packet at our own name servers. And every time we fired it at a name server, the name server would die. So that's interesting. So we fired at other people's name servers, and their name servers died. And then we realized very quickly we had something quite interesting. Um, and we built a script, and then we realized we could take a country offline. And then that got really interesting. And this is what's known as what's called a packet of death. Um, and what packet of death is, any software that ingests it uh, instantly causes a buffer overrun. You get a memory overflow, and it dies. And we realized, actually, we wanted to take the US offline. We could take the US offline. Uh, not surprisingly. Uh, few people got very excited and interested about that, namely the UK government and the US government. And this uh, was, was our real breakthrough. At the time when Obama was talking about, you know, could we have a kill switch for the internet? And everybody's saying, you can't take the internet down. It's too big. It's too hard. We had a way of taking the internet down. Uh, now, OK, you, to be fair, this turn knocks DNS resolvers offline. It doesn't knock the whole internet infrastructure. But the reality of it is, if DNS doesn't resolve, then actually the internet kind of doesn't work. And so actually, we had a very interesting uh, piece of software at that point. This really got the attention of our board. This really got the attention of the board of GCHQ and various other people. Um, this made it to number 10 Downing Street. It made it to the White House briefing. And we got this fixed. Because clearly, this was something that could be weaponized and something that could be used. But this goes back to that thing about go back to the early days of think differently, look at things differently, and you get really interesting and surprising results. Nobody was searching out. When all of that research work into is there a kill switch for the internet, nobody thought about looking at DNS. And I think that's one of the things that, that has surprised us most. So again, we went back. We said, we really have something. The board said, have lots of money at that point. To that point you know, actually, it was very straightforward now to talk to the CFO. Um, he said, this is an amazing tool. Go build it. We built an even stronger team. Uh, we put them together, and we spent two years developing it further on. So this now is a journey of six, seven years at this point um, to this capability. And last month, we launched the new tool, uh, Nominet's active cybersecurity tool, uh, based on all of that research work, all of those alphas and all of those betas that we talked about earlier on. Everything that I've talked about and more is in that capability. We had to go completely back to uh, basics again in terms of how we use it. It turns out that not everybody's that interested in DNS. Uh, which, which uh, was a bit of a shock to us. Actually, what people are really interested in is, is protecting their business. So actually, we had to take all the DNS geekery and put that in the back of it, and we actually had to turn the tool and say, how do we use the DNS geekery to solve the problems that people's businesses really have? And we looked at those problems, and we talked to hundreds and hundreds of customers and potential customers. And what we did is we took the same capability, and we just said, you just need something that lights up and tells you when you've got problems. And that's exactly what it does. So we built, you know, we built a complete system that, that, that looks for the kind of all the problems that, you, that I know many of you are tackling every day. It's incredibly effective at finding them, uh, and it's incredibly effective at finding stuff you, you're not looking for too, which I think is really interesting. Just to mention, we've had some very early customers of this, um, some names that you probably recognize. Um, uh, we are very early in that stage, but people are very interested in looking at this technology, and we've been working with some of those. I'm going to just tell a few, uh, hopefully I've still got some time, just going to tell a few stories uh, from, from some of those customers. Um, we talked a bit about malware. Sorry, yep. Sam, sorry. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Number one, will the slides be available for download? Yes. Yeah. 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 
slides that you are presenting? No. <laughs> uh, okay. So okay. the question, the answer is no. <laughs> if you want to take some notes and if you want to ask please do questions, exactly yeah. Please do. Yeah. We are reading the questions off Slido, so Colin, since you put your name there, thank you for using Slido. Uh, anybody else can use it also. The next question: Do you feel that the number of top-level domain choices now presents a security challenge to the average or to any business? Yes. Good question. Is the answer to that one? Yes, is the answer. Yeah, absolutely. I think the challenge, the challenge with having so many uh, many domain choices is, is you know, businesses have got to protect protect themselves against people. Uh, uh, squatting on names, you know, for example, PayPal is a good example. You know, PayPal have got to protect themselves across over a thousand domain names. There are mechanisms in place to do that. There's the trademark clearinghouse, which handles a lot of that. But absolutely, IDNs actually are a real challenge. A good example is PayPal.com. If you do it in Cyrillic, it looks exactly like PayPal.com. You just use a different character. Yeah. Um, it's a completely different domain because it's an it's an internationalized domain name. So you, it, but it looks like PayPal.com when you when you're in the browser. It isn't PayPal.com. So it's mutual. Does anyone agree that the number of TLD options presents a security challenge? Show of hands? Pretty much everyone. Okay, so we'll put that in the survey question. Uh, Alex, do you have something else? Anybody else with a one mic or want to use this? Okay, carry on. Great. We have some time. Brilliant. Okay, well, I've only got a few more minutes. I just want to show you some examples of some of the things that some of the things that we do find when we look at this. You know, as I said, we talked about malware, but actually, it's re it's really straightforward to spot malware when you start. Ask, just just you tell a system to start looking for unusual patterns of traffic. Shouldn't be going. You know, not going to domains that people normally go to. Uh, traffic that's moving around. Actually, malware is very straightforward to spot when you're running this against your DNS. And here we got a little spike from one of our customers just look, just seeing. Uh, Seeing straight away IP addresses, where it's going, where it's coming from, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it very easy to fix. Phishing is something we see a lot of going on. Um, phishing, is, of course, uses a very different mechanism. It uses DNS, but it's looking for MX records, okay? So what we're seeing is people coming in and looking for you know, your name, your name underscore surname at your domain, for example, your name underscore your middle name underscore your surname. You know, they'll try and they'll try and they'll try and they'll try and they'll fire thousands and thousands of mail exchange queries at your system to try and get them to get a response that goes, yes, correct, that is the correct. So we see this is called whitelisting um, until they've got your, it's a bit like password hacking, just keep going, keep going, guess an email address. You've probably all got LinkedIn accounts, you know, the, so your name's out there, the company's out there. Do a bit of basic research, and actually we can probably guess most of your email addresses here. We can then start slamming you with phishing mails. Actually, it's this when you can see the MX queries coming in and out of your systems, actually you can block them very quickly from, bot, from the botnets that are looking for these. It lights up with the IP addresses that are sending those in, blacklist them, and you've got that problem sorted. So quite interesting. Again, looking at the DNS traffic gives you some really interesting results. Uh, denial of service is interesting. So this is this uh, was a few months back. These enormous red dots we see on the uh, on the screen here. Um, it's quite a well-known attack. This this is Lloyd's actually. This is Lloyd's TSP. Um, uh, again, really interesting data. We we didn't set out to look for Lloyd's TSP traffic, but we ended up helping them out on it. What was interesting about Lloyd's was they were seeing over a million DNS queries a second. It was an enormous attack. Okay, this is per second, um, the largest we've ever seen in the UK for anybody. Um, what was really interesting about the Lloyds attack was, again, you didn't set out to look for this, but you probably, it's a bit small on the screen. It's called a randomized subdomain attack. And what they're doing is actually, it was only about 10,000 computers doing this, which is fascinating. What they were doing is randomizing the, a pre, uh, the, the prefix in front of Lloyds, lloydsbank.co.uk. And the, what that was causing was causing, instead of hitting the cache, it was causing it, their names to have to respond every single time. That took them offline for two hours. Uh, again, because we sat and monitored, we're, we're not, Lloyd's are not a customer. Had they been a customer, they'd have seen the IP addresses that were coming from, there's only 10,000, blacklist them, end of DDoS. So uh, really interesting when you start, again, looking at this traffic. Um, uh, those of you who remember TalkTalk? Talk. Uh, yep. So in this case, did you reach out to uh, Lloyd's to update them about that? We did, we spoke to them about this, yeah. yeah. Uh, TalkTalk's an interesting one. Those remember the attack on TalkTalk. Talk. Um, Again, TalkTalk, Talk, not a customer of ours, but we did what we did do is we helped them out during their problems. And actually what we did, we looked at their traffic, we pointed the tool at it, and we just said, tell us what's going on. And actually what was going on was we looked right back over the three years previous to TalkTalk, Talk, and a month before, almost exactly a month the day before the uh, attack on TalkTalk, Talk, we saw these two spikes. And these spikes were the perpetrators having a go, having a try, 
And actually, they couldn't spot these. There's not that many, actually. I think it was 12,000 queries a second. Not that many queries, actually. But what they were doing was having a, quick, uh, having a go at testing out their tech ready for the big day. Now, actually, if you're monitoring for unusual traffic coming in from unusual places, your lights up. And actually, had they known this a month in advance, they probably could have prepared the defences a bit better. So quite interesting when you start to look, when you're just looking for the unusual um, rather than looking for the usual. Um, this is a fun one. Um, this is uh, DNS tunneling. So this again, this is this this tends to show itself actually through actually slightly unusual query sizes in DNS. Um, what you're looking at here is a mobile operator in the South America being robbed of revenue. Um, when we went to work, they are a customer of ours. Well, they asked us to come in and look, and they said something weird's going on in our network. We just don't know what. What we do know is the amount of the amount of money we're getting compared to the amount of data that's being used is not right. And that was because over 10,000 of their customers had downloaded a piece of software called Iodine, put it on their phone, put it on their home computer, and they were tunneling under the paywall for data, and they were using DNS to do that. So the way they were doing it is they're loading the DNS packets up with, with bits of YouTube video, firing them down, comes in through the firewall, which of course you leave nice and open. Uh, oldest trick in the book, this one, if you want to get free Wi-Fi in the airport. Um, and uh, actually, it lit up like, a, again, from that, you pull the IP addresses, you can have a gentle chat with your customers about maybe recovering some of that revenue. Um, this is kind of fun when it's a mobile operator, but actually, if you're a big business here, if you're a Rolls-Royce or you're a Kinetic or you're working for government, actually, could this, this be, uh, could this be your business plans or your schematics leaking out through DNS? It's really tough to spot this kind of work because actually you've got to leave port 53 open so, you, so your, your customers and your staff can get out to the internet. But actually, if you've got a capability just to look at unusual patterns in traffic, it lights up like a Christmas tree and you can see what's going on. Obviously, you've got everything you need to do to track down the individual here. You've got the IP address where it's coming from and where it's going to. So not only can you catch the individual, you can catch where it's, you, if there's somebody else in the, in the chain, you can catch them too. So it's a very powerful way of looking at some of these threats. This is a nice one. Um, this is uh, a transport provider who asked us to do some work with them uh, as a proof of concept. And they, they, they felt everything was in a pretty good shape, actually. They said, but tell us if anything uh, isn't in a good shape. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out every single one of their payment terminals uh, was infected and was sending data to Russia, which is unfortunate when you're putting your credit card into a ticket machine. So uh, we very quickly said to them, that's weird. Do you have any business in Russia? Uh, why, you, why have you got network traffic going out? Turns out they don't. Uh, turns out we got that fixed very fast. And you can imagine the rep. As it turns out, none of the credit card details were leaked. Everyone was safe. But you imagine the reputational damages would be if this got out. Um, particularly in a GDPR world, it doesn't bear thinking about. So actually, again, just looking for unusual patterns tends to lead you to some quite interesting results. Hmm. This is, this is the software looking for patterns of unusual data. No, as simple as that. Of the nope. No, this is just using, that, using those algorithms to say, tell me something's different, show me what's going on. And actually, you can very quickly see what's going on. Um, last one, ransomware. We're all familiar with this. Uh, you all know about WannaCry. Fantastic way of spotting WannaCry. Uh, of course, first thing you do is you just say to it, keep an eye out for the kill switch domain. The moment somebody gets infected, bing, up it pops, you get a dot. Uh, go get the computer fixed, get it unplugged from the network and fix it. Um, we were able to do this quite efficient, efficiently on a bunch of our clients. Very, very fast way of spotting it. Again, the first thing that any, uh, any ransomware needs to do is call home. So as soon as it calls home, you've got it. And so actually, uh, we were able to capture uh, various machines around. Uh, in, this, in this case, this was on the government network. We were able to capture various machines uh, and uh, get them fixed. And last one as well, crypto mining. We see quite a bit of this. Uh, I don't know how many of you know how many crypto miners you've got in your network. I think you'd be surprised to find out that you've, that you've got, uh, that some of your end users have got browser plugins and got various bits that are crypto mining. Um, most crypto mining is, pre, you know, by and large is probably, isn't causing you specifically any harm. But the problem you've got is, as CISOs, is you've got, you've got your compute resource and your business being used for somebody else's business. And that's not a great place to be. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, this stuff's pretty benign. It might even be that the, one of your um, end users is actually uh, 
is using it for their own, you know, they're getting a little bit of money themselves and it's all perfectly legitimate. But actually, if you've got executables on your machine that are busy mining away, what else could they be doing? And what we do know is that a lot of this stuff goes back into the dark web, a lot of it goes back in terms of, uh, and is used for funding all sorts of businesses that we probably don't want to be involved in. Um, again, it's very easy to spot crypto mining. It has a very distinct pattern. It has a very distinct network uh, uh, traffic signature, um, and it visits very specific domains. So actually, once you're sitting and watching for this, it, it, again, it lights up like a Christmas tree, just like ransomware. Um, so you can choose how you want to tackle that, that threat. And lastly, yeah, just the very last thing is we, uh, as a result of doing this work, actually, uh, the government got very interested, and we now run this capability across uh, the whole of the public sector. Um, not only do we run the analytic capability, we now run the DNS for them as well, and we're moving most of uh, government and public services across as we speak. Um, it's part of the active cyber defence programme, um, and uh, we are rolling out across the, a lot of the public sector. We'll have 700 government departments on it fairly shortly, and then hopefully uh, various other bits of government and public service uh, online uh, after that. Um, we are helping the government clean up their network to make sure that their, that their uh, network is as clean as it can be. Not surprisingly, they knew as soon as we put this on that we'd find, and we have found some amazingly interesting stuff. Uh, you know, what's interesting is, um, what's interesting is just actually some of the non-cyber things they find. You know, they find they're finding departments buying bits of software that they're not supposed to have bought because, of course, it lights up and says, "Here I am calling off to Azure Cloud or AWS or somewhere else." Again, you know, when you start to look for patterns, actually, what you see is you see really interesting stuff. So it doesn't, it's not always about detecting threats. Sometimes it's just about looking and just making sure you can audit what your business is doing. So we've uh, we've been having some fun with those guys, uh, and that's a very exciting project for us, and we'll be running for the next three years. So really, uh, that's, that's me largely finished. Uh, the, the moral of the story, I think, the takeout is, you know, we've been able to do some really interesting stuff. We've had an incredible amount of um, fulfillment out of kind of taking some of those early problems and some of those challenges and kind of saying, how do, we, how do we do something different? How do we think differently from everybody else? How do we challenge those preconceptions? It isn't easy. You know, having, having ideas and trying to get, you know, you need bright people, you need people who are prepared to really graft it out to make it happen. But if you do it, and if you do it inside your own businesses, I think you'd be absolutely amazed at what you can find. Um, if you are interested in coming to talk about what we do, then please do pop by. We're outside, we're here, you, you see us all around. Um, we'd love to talk. Um, if you just want to have a chat about actually how to kick off an innovation program inside your cyber, but your bits of the business, come and talk as well, because it's something we've got, you know, we've got some experience in now, some of the, some of the highs and some of the lows to avoid, but how to, how to keep your business engaged. We'd be delighted to talk. You know, um, as I say, we're a public benefit business. Um, we, exist, we don't exist to make a profit. We exist to, to uh, take any profits and surplus that we make and, and use those for good causes, um, and, uh, which is what we do. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, my details are there if you want to get in touch with me. I'm happy to share some of this content with you under NDA as well, um, if that's what you'd like. <laughs>